as it relates to some guys uh, coming back or not. Um, first off, do we know is uh, is Joseph definitely out for Sunday? He will be out for Sunday. Yes. Gilman uh, Webb. Low and Webb. Low is day to day. Um, Mark is going to be out this week. Do you know uh, with Kenneth? You mentioned he, had a, he rolled his ankle. Is, is that something that's going to hold him back this week? Do you know? It won't. He'll be at practice today. With uh, Jerry and Christian, are they going to be activated at some point this week? They should be. Yes. So I think like, their ten, like Jerry's ten days is up Thursday and Christian's is Friday, I believe. So it is. Uh, is it going to be based on health? Like how they're feeling? Or do you yeah. Sort of just. Like, yeah, we're kind of taking it case by case, just making sure. I mean, those both those guys are feeling fine right now, but just when they get back doing football, just want to be aware of, um, you know, their overall conditioning, and and so we just want to be able to assess that, and then uh, how much they play or, or don't play will just be kind of predicated on, um, you know, their endurance and all that stuff. And how's Asante's uh, in the protocol, and he's day to day. With Kenneth, is that same ankle that caused him to go on? Yes. Run? Yeah, it's just that he kind of, on a run play, just kind of rolled it and just kind of sore. So we just want to keep an eye on it during the game and uh, we'll watch it this week. But he'll be at practice today. Just one of those concerns throughout the season, too, because once you get an ankle sprain like that during the season, it never quite gets 100%. It can be. It can be. And, and that's what we got to do our, our best to make sure that we're practicing the right way, making sure that uh, that thing can get as healthy as can as it can be week to week. and. Um, really building that strength and mobility as the season goes. And uh, so, uh, like I said, he'll be out there at practice today. We'll be going during individual. Uh, and then after that, we'll kind of tone it down more of a jog through, walk through. Anyone else who uh, you're not expecting to practice today? I don't think so. Not, not, not that I'm aware of from the game. Everybody else should be good. Brandon, there's been times where defenders will come up to tackle, and instead of tackling, they're trying to strip the ball. Mm -hmm. and more yards are being gained, and sometimes it turns from potentially being maybe like a third down into a first down because they basically plow their way through. Is that a concern of yours, that guys are trying to go for the strip instead of just bringing guys down, or do you tell the guys anything like that? No, our, our kind of philosophy defensively is the second man in is, is the guy that's responsible of attacking the football. The first guy in is the, the tackler and the, you know, he's the aggressor that, w that we kind of use that language that you're the aggressor and then the second guy in is the ball hawk. Uh, so anytime we have multiple people at the football, that first guy in is responsible for the runner and then the second, third, fourth guys in are responsible for the ball. So I think we're doing a good job of attacking the ball. I know at that, that midway juncture, we were leading the NFL in force fumbles and I think that we're trending positive. Uh, I really like the way we're, you know, our mindset of being ball aware and I felt last week that we tackled really well in the Steelers game, uh, better than the Minnesota game for sure. So um, we're going to continue to emphasize that because we all know that the team with the ball wins, the team who attacks the ball and, and takes care of it wins. So we're going to continue to try and do that. And, and I think where we've made real progress is, uh, you know, the strip sacks on the quarterback. You know, we were able to get another one uh, against Ben, and you know, the, you know, he got the bounce. But we're doing a much better job in pass rush of getting the football too. And I think that's going to be really important for us as we go down the stretch. Brian, this weekend you're facing Vic Fangio. What is his relationship meant? Uh, the relationship that you guys have, what has that meant for you? Yeah, Vic, I mean, Vic means a lot to me. I mean, as much as anybody in the NFL that I've been able to work with, um, he's made uh, a huge impact on, on the way I coach, um, the way I view the game. And, you know, he certainly stood the test of time in the NFL. And I just really admire his path, you know, he didn't have an easy path to coach in. And he just has an incredible work ethic, incredible focus. I think he's really global with the game, being able to change with the game. Uh, wherever he's been, they've had incredible defenses, starting with the Dome Patrol. You know, that linebacking crew that he had with the Dome Patrol, I don't think people remember that group of four guys were his guys, you know. And, um, you know, Von Johnson, Sam Mills, Pat Swilling, Ricky Jackson. I mean, you're talking about, you know, Ricky Jackson, a Hall of Famer and Pat Swilling, a Defensive Player of the Year. And, um, you know, and then he became a D coordinator with the, the Carolina Panthers, an expansion team, and um, they led the NFL in sacks. Kevin Green was a Defensive Player of the Year, a Hall of Fame player, uh, you know, and, you know, he's just stood the test of time. He's been, you know, uh, you know, obviously those San Francisco defenses he had in the, you know, the 2010, that kind of decade, 
I mean, that, those groups were as good as any in the last 20 years with, you know, Navarro and Pat and Alden Smith and Justin Smith and uh, that group of players. And, and what he's done is he's been able to evolve and, and grow as a coach wherever he's been. And he's been able to move with the dynamics of the NFL in terms of the offensive explosion in the league. And, and so that's something I've always taken away from him. And I was fortunate to be with him in Chicago. And a lot of people talk about our group at the end of Chicago. We were number one. But when he got there, they, he, you know, they were the worst defense in the NFL when he got there. And then he got them kind of mid, midway, you know, halfway um, in his first two years. And then we were in the top ten my first year with him. And then we were the best defense the second year. And then we went to Denver. We were in the top ten. And he's got another top ten group this year. And, uh, you know, just the consistency and performance. Um, he, you know, I was a Division three assistant coach. And for one of the best coaches of the last 30 years, um, to see something in you and to, to take that chance on you when so many others wouldn't, um, you know, in a place like Chicago that's known for defense, to be able to, hey, I'm going to hire this guy that no one's ever heard of um, to coach the position that I coach. And he's an outside rusher coach. So I always took that really seriously that I'm coaching the position that he coached. And I just I had a front row seat to uh, an incredible football coach. And um, he's certainly the reason why I was able to become a D coordinator with the Rams because the amount of respect that Sean and all the offensive coaches in this league have for him. And I wouldn't be um, where I am today without him, you know, because I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity with Sean if it weren't for Vic. And so, um, you know, all those guys mean a lot to me, not just Vic, but Ed Donatell is a huge mentor for me. He's a guy that's as good of a coach that I've ever been around. That, that group of coaches, Reggie Herring, Chris Beak, Bill Kolar, Mike Keystan, Nathaniel Willingham on defense, those guys I spent a lot of time with. And then, um, you know, those guys on offense too, Mike Munchak, Zach Azani, Chris Modkins, um, those guys mean a lot to me too. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's something that's special about the NFL, being able to go to head to head with people that are close to you. Uh, that's part of that fraternity. And um, we'll have to be at our best because they're going to be ready to play. From a football perspective, and X's and O's perspective, how much does the familiarity you guys have with each other in, in defense, how does that impact? Your game plan. Does it does it change your approach at all because of that familiarity? No, I just think um, you know we have a strong sense of uh, you know how he assesses things, um, how they do things. But again, what makes him such a great coach is that he can morph week to week into something different, and that's why he stood the test of time. Because just when you think that uh, you know Vic is settled into something, then he ambushes you with something different. And I had a front row seat to that, and it's that evolution as a coach that makes him so unique. And then. You know, he has the principles that are never changing about tackling and taking the ball away and playing blocks, physical, uh, the scouting report, knowing the opponent tendencies. He's as good of a scouting coach as there is. Uh, so he has those staples that don't change, and they're going to be very well prepared. He's got this group playing really well. This group's playing different than we did when I was there. You know, he's, he's playing to the strengths of that group that they have now, and uh, he's doing a, another great coaching job for sure. The, the growth in Chicago when you were with Vic, are in comparison to your team now. Are you have do you have a three year plan for this team? Are you how are your how is your growth um, expect expectancy? Excuse me, um, with this team here now. Because yeah, looking back, comparing it to your time in Chicago. Yeah, I think I think you just uh, you know every circumstance is, is unique in the NFL, and you can't just say same as. Uh, you can't just say, hey, this is the way we did it here, and then I'm going to do it here. You just you have to be able to evolve with with the pieces that you have, and then you know over time, then you can grow to maybe get it exactly how you want it. But with the NFL the way it is now, it's just so dynamic. The way you were able to build a team, you know, 10, 15 years ago isn't the same because of just free agency and the contract length and. Um, all that good stuff. So uh, the way you know the way the cap is, the way the draft is. So you know you you truly have to treat things year to year, week to week, and that's what, something I learned being with him, and and that's something that we did in Chicago. That group we had in Chicago was, um, you know, it started off much different than what he had in San Francisco. You know, and and as a guy that studied him extensively, when he first got to Chicago, it was very different. And then over time, he was able to build it, and we were able to look you know, the way you need to look in this league. And, and, and that's why we had a great group. We had a bunch of really, really good players that were invested in how we want to play. And, and that's something he's good at. And when you get that type of time to build a defense um, and, and you're as good of a coach as he is, then you're able to achieve the results um, that he's been able to achieve. And, but I think it's really about the principles that he has. Because he's, like, if you go back to the way he coached in 1985, with New Orleans and the way he is now, he's really grown as a coach. And that's something I really respect are the coaches that evolve over time because the NFL is changing. And so I think that that's something that makes him such a unique guy. Coach, how did the complexion of Denver's offense change with Jerry Judy and 
Yeah, Jerry Judy is a separator. I mean, they've got an outstanding, outstanding receiver core. I mean, KJ Hamler's hurt. He's got real juice. Uh, but, you know, I was with Cortland Sutton and Tim Patrick, okay? And those guys just signed extensions this week, and they deserve them. Those guys are really, really, really good players. And I have a ton of respect for them, you know, because I coach Bradley Chubb, who's, who's really – tight with those guys and I got to know both those guys and I got a lot of respect for them as competitors and then you know those guys are six four guys outside and then you get Jerry who's a first round separator um, he's an engine that can play in the slot or out wide um, he's good after the catch and so you know they've got a very complete receiving core and then you add in a guy like Noah that can really stretch the field and then you know the other tight end Albert from Missouri he, he's you know a stretch tight end too he can get vertical in the seam and then they got two really quality backs I mean two really quality backs so they're a very complete skill group and uh, you know, definitely a difficult cover. And then they got a quarterback that has played a ton and has seen everything. And you know, he's been a starter at you know, three different, you know, now four different teams. And he's come from, you know, has an outstanding pedigree. And so um, you know, this is a very well-coached team. And the receiving core and their skill players are really, really good. Yeah, it was big. I, I, again, I was, I was kind of fortunate that I'd been studying him for a really long time. When he got to Stanford, I was in junior college, and he had taken that Stanford group from like in the 90s and the 100s to like in the top 20 at a place like Stanford. And so he caught my eye then when I was in junior college. And then when he went to the Niners right away, there was an explosion there. 2011 after the lockout, right away, that defense just bam, you know, they hit it and then they go on this four year run. And I just, I really liked the way they played. I studied all their film. Um, just kind of the goodwill hunting, you know, the Harvard education for a dollar fifty in late chargers at the public library. You know, I just took that approach. I was going to study everything, and so what I did was, is I had a lot of his examples from San Francisco in my teach tapes at Carroll, and so what I did was, is I kind of brought a lot of my install tapes from Carroll, showing our Carroll film and then showing his film and how we taught our players, um, and I felt like. Um, it was an authentic way to go into an interview and say, hey, this is what I've been doing. And the thing about Vic is that he appreciates people that do the work, you know, that are really studying. And then he knew that I'd gone back a long way, you know, and getting these examples. And they were good teach examples. You know, they were, they were worthy clips, you know, of little things that mean a lot to him in several different areas. Um, and during the interview, he didn't say anything to me, you know, and it was a really tough deal because I'm not getting any feedback on what's going down in this interview. I mean, silence, nothing. He's the type of guy, no expression, nothing. I have no idea how I'm doing. I'm trying my best. I feel like I'm killing it, but I got nothing from this guy. And we take a break and you know, they kind of ask me and I tell them I, I have no idea what's going on with this guy. And um, they're like, that's a good thing. You know, and then we kind of got to the end, kind of got to the end and uh, the very end. And, you know, and then I kind of realized that you know, it was going to go, it was going to go down. Um, and he made me work. He made me earn it. And that's why he's special. Um, but again, that, that interview was a big moment for me. Um, and I was ready for it. And, and he had a lot to do with it because I'd been studying him and, um, you know, that gave me a big edge. And when you would interview other assistants for your staff and stuff, have you taken the same mode of the stone cold silence and <laughs> make them work for it uh, too? Yeah, Vic, Vic has kind of a, uh, a flair for, you know, candor, uh, that's one of his endearing qualities. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, a little bit different that way. Um, maybe I'll, I'll become that, but I'm not that right now. Um, but uh, I think the, the one thing about the, you know, what I've learned in the interview process is being open-minded uh, because I was a Division three college assistant sitting down with one of the deep, best defensive coordinators of the last 30 years, and the odds of that aren't good. So, you know, just casting a wide net and having your eyes open, your ears open, because you can find coaches in a lot of different places if you're looking in the right spots and you're willing to open your mind. And so I've kind of learned from that and hoping to embody that moving forward. How much has there been an advantage having Ronaldo Hill, who also coached with Vic and you guys spending each other to kind of translate that defense over as opposed to maybe somebody from outside the system? Yeah, it's, a, it's an advantage for sure. Um, because of the language and because of the, the philosophical approach, you understand the context, you've been exposed to it. You know, we have two guys that played in that system, John Timu, Mike Wilhoyt, who are coaches for us. They've lived it, you know, they've, be, you know, they've profited from it, you know, as players. They know that this can help, 
help you. And so when you have that type of foundation, that type of framework, and then Jay Rogers was with Vic in, in Chicago, you know, we worked together in Chicago. You have a, a f what, you, what you're trying to do in coaching is create a staff where you have philosophical alignment. Um, and then, you know, then you let the competition of ideas take over. But if you, you have to have a philosophical alignment in how we do things. And uh, when, you, when you have people that have been a part of something like that, it allows you to take things further, faster. And, and that's what we're doing here is we've joined up with a bunch of really, really, really superstar coaches. And that's just the truth. And, um, and, and that's helped us become, you know, what we're capable of being. Monday, you talked about Foco and you said he was a multiplier. Yeah. Which I think that you've used that term before. What does that mean? Just he makes people better. Um, he, he's a commander for us inside. Um, our nose kind of orchestrates things up front with our front mechanics. And so he's running the show to the guys to the right and the left of him. Um, subtle things within our front, and we have that guy as kind of a general for us. So that part, aspect of it, and then he's also, like his leadership, his energy, his toughness, he's a guy that affects you in a positive way at the game um, because he's a fearless competitor, and so that's what I mean by that, by a multiplier. He's making more things happen for you than just with his own performance. Uh, and so uh, just, you know, he played really well the other night, and I'm, I'm proud of him. He's got to keep getting better for us.